Well, good morning, Grace. Welcome to our online service today. And uh, it is a sweet time of the year because winter is almost behind us. Spring is one day away. And today, Sung Kim, our lead pastor, is going to bring us a message around the theme of sex. Yes, you heard me correctly, sex. And it's an topic that's often left unaddressed in the context of church. Yeah, there, there are a lot of topics like that, that a lot of times as a body of faith, we feel uncomfortable addressing. And that's why at Grace, we want to dive into these sorts of topics together as a community and see what God has to say about them. But of course, all of that can't fit into a Sunday service. And that's why we want to invite you to connect with us throughout the week. You can take a next step to connect with us right in the Grace Churches app, whether that means joining a community group where we wrestle with tough issues and real conversations in a group of eight to 16 people, or whether that means uh, going to the Grace Churches app to check out Rhythms of Grace, our midweek podcast where Pastor Sung Kim and Nate Kimball talk about everyday issues of faith, things that don't quite fit into a Sunday sermon. So whatever your next step is, you can take that right there in the app today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we're excited about people who are taking the next step here to give for the first time. You know, an important aspect of our shared life together here at Grace is generosity. We want to invest our lives and our resources in things that last for eternity. And you can give a gift in a number of ways here at Grace. The best way is just to go to our Grace Church app and hit that Give button. But you can also go to our website at gracechurch.city slash give, or you can text an email to 84321. Now we want to invite you to join us in a time of worship where we'll raise our voices in praise to our great God. So shake up the ground and fall. 
In 1875, the young British poet William Ernest Henley penned the famous poem Invictus, which is Latin for unconquered, and it concludes with the words, It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. And although the poem first inspires, in the context of real life, it's quickly exposed as a distorted view of reality built on a faulty foundation of pride. You see, the ma vast majority of our lives are absolutely out of our control, like what century you're born in, who your parents are, your physical stature, or even your intellectual makeup. But more importantly, anyone who has suffered knows that such youthful exuberance falls on its face in times of trials and tragedy. And while we can't always control our circumstances, we do have a choice in how we will live in the midst of them. And this question, how we will live, what we might call our ethics in difficult times, is exactly where we find ourselves when we open up to Job chapter 31. You see, in this chapter, Job is giving his final defense before God. And if you imagine a courtroom setting, Job is like a defendant who is making his closing arguments to declare his in innocence. And at the end of this chapter, he basically says, I rest my case. If you remember, Job is a good man who has experienced great suffering. And throughout the book, we've seen Job and his friends going back and forth. And his friends are pushing half-truths. And they're saying, like, you're suffering, Job. And that must mean that there's some personal sin that is directly related to all of the suffering. And Job responds to them by saying, yes, look, I I I'm a fallen person. But, but I'm blameless regarding this situation. And so he gives his final plea of innocence. And there's a pattern throughout his closing argument that begins with the phrase, if I have done this, if I have done that, and he repeats that over and over again throughout the chapter, then may God judge me. You see, Job is responding to his friend's critique about not caring for the poor or harboring secret sexual sins and being unscrupulous with his wealth. The accusation is that Job is guilty particularly in the areas of money, sex, and power. Or, or what Tim Keller famously calls in his book, Counterfeit Gods. You see, in the first 12 verses of chapter 31, Job approaches the topic of sex, 
showing us the need for purity of heart. Here's how he begins the chapter in verse 1. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. And so here is the age-old topic of lust. Now, before we go on, let's be clear about what lust is and what it's not. First, lust is not simply sexual desire. I mean, that is a gift given to us by God. Rather, lust is is sexual desire that objectifies another person and defies God's design. Next, lust is also not just sexual attraction. But rather, lust is when sexual attraction turns into self-gratification. And so in in this passage, Joe compares sexual desire to a fire that consumes. And and that's a great way for us to think about lust and sexual desire. Because you see, fire in and of itself is a good thing. It's used to cook food or heat a room. Fire is good as long as it is contained within the proper boundaries. And when a fire gets outside the fireplace, for example, it is destructive and consumes. And so the analogy is, so it is with sexual desire. It's a good thing that God created. It is a gift that God gives to humanity, but within his purposes and design. Now, what I want us to see about lust is not just what it is, but what it does. And we see here in this passage Job talks about the different effects of lust. And so, uh, first, what we see that Job will talk about is that lust is offensive to God. Now, you might hear that and wonder, well, why? I mean, why is it offensive to God? I'm just checking somebody out from a distance and, and letting my mind wander, right? Like, why does God care about that? And so often we think of God as a cosmic killjoy that he capriciously prohibits us from having fun. But we miss out on the fact that God wants us to delight in his creation. And I want to remind you that sex was God's idea. It wasn't God's design to create us as asexual robots and somehow the serpent came to Adam in the beginning and said, Hey, Adam, I have an idea. What if you did this? And that God is in heaven looking down saying, Adam? Adam, don't, don't do that. That's not how, uh, that, you know, that, that, that's not how it happened, right? God, uh, this sex was God's idea. He wants us to take delight in his creation within his purposes and design for it. And I think that's important to talk about because when sex is talked about in the church, especially, people often leave with the idea that sex is bad and dirty. So stay away from it. No, according to the Bible, sex is beautiful and sacred. It is a gift from God and brings glory to God when it is done within God's design. So we need to understand that the reason why it is offensive to God is because it is a prideful rejection of his purpose and design. We see that in verse 2 and 3 when Job says this, For what is our lot from God above, our heritage from the Almighty on high? Is it not ruin for the wicked, disaster for those who do wrong? And again, this is following the verse where he talks about not making a, coven- making a covenant with his eyes, not to look lustfully at a woman. And he says it, just, it, 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 it is displeasing to God. So we see that lust is first uh, offensive and displeasing to God, but we also see that it is destructive to ourselves. In verse 5, Job says, If I have walked with falsehood, or my foot has hurried after deceit. Now, when we get caught in sexual sin, so often what happens is that we hide it from other people. And then we start justifying it to ourselves. And we start walking in in this pathway that, that Job talks about in deceit and duplicity. And again, God does not want to keep us from joy. He wants to del- He wants us to delight in his many gifts. So he calls us to not lust because he knows it is destructive to our soul. I, I, I love what uh, author Frederick Buechner says about, about this. He says, lust is the craving for salt of a person who is dying of thirst. And so in drinking salt water, To quench your thirst, you actually become more thirsty. 
you know, in the past two weeks, we've seen a couple significant Christian leaders uh, credibly accused and investigated. One, a megachurch pastor in Canada, and the other, a f- the former editor of th- one of the largest Christian magazines because they engaged in patterns hidden for years and even decades of sexualized behavior classified as both harassment and abuse that were far outside the bounds of God's vision for humanity. But we don't have to look out there to the world uh, of the famous and well-known. I mean, I've known at least a dozen friends and acquaintances who are pastors and ministry leaders who completely destroyed their ministry, their family, and their lives due to the impact of unchecked lust that have led to infidelity of various kinds. We don't even have to think about well-known pastors or even people or leaders that we know. We, We could just look in the mirror knowing that we too have lingered over thirst traps. We, we know we should scroll past, clicked on links we know we should avoid, uh, stared at people with only our own pleasure in mind and stream things that our eyes struggle to unsee even after the screen goes blank. So we see that loss is, is not only off, uh, offensive to God and it's destructive to self, but finally, we also see uh, in this passage that lust is degrading to others. A lot of times, when we think about lust, we only think about it in terms of ourselves, or maybe, maybe about how God thinks about it. But some of the things that Job says here shows us the nature of lust. That it's not only a spiritual issue or even a moral issue, but it's also an ethical issue. In other words, it affects the people around us and our society as a whole. Look what he says in verse 9 and 10. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I've lurked at my neighbor's door. Like that, that image of lurking at his neighbor's door is a picture of, of, of somebody waiting outside his neighbor's house, waiting for the husband to leave so he could go, he could go in and sleep with the man's wife. So Job is saying, look, if I've not only been enticed in my heart, but if I've taken action uh, on my lust, then look what he says as the consequence of that in verse 10. Then may my wife grind another man's grain and may other men sleep with her. Now, let me explain the context here, but it, because it might not mean what you think it means when it says grind, right? Grinding another man. Like Job wasn't talking about his wife going to the club here. So let me unpack this a bit. It's showing the implications of his sin, which is lust, right? How dare you think such dirty thoughts? So if he goes and sleeps with his neighbor's wife, that then... Uh, what that's going to do is tear their family apart and leave his wife, who was under Job's covering out in the open, leaving her to do forced labor for another man. So his sin has implications for her and how life plays out after that. Now, the irony is that it works in both Hebrew and English here, uh, that that, uh, th- that word grind does have sexual connotations. So maybe you were a bit right in thinking about the club or whatever you thought when you first heard the word, uh, heard about Job's wife grinding, right? Not only does Job's sin put her in a forced labor situation, but in a situation where she might be sexually exploited. And so it's degrading to others. And it's so important for us to get a handle on this because so often we think of pornography, for example, as a victimless act. It doesn't really affect or hurt anybody else. I mean, we need to understand the societal implications as well. And so think about it like this. The porn industry fuels sexual slavery and objectifies women and men. And we, when we talk about pornography, I'm talking about men and women, adults and, and kids, right? Just think about how it works. Every time you go on a website and click, yes, I'm 18, you're adding one more hit to that website, which makes it that much more popular, which gives them that much more money for advertisement, which builds the industry even more which provides more opportunities and jobs for men and women to enter into pornography, most of whom didn't grow up dreaming about that, but who grew up being abused and willing to do anything to make money or find love. So it's not just between you and God. 
It's not just between you and your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend. You see, there's even physiological effects of this, and studies in neuroscience show that porn rewires your brain. It normalizes something unrealistic, which results in reality being boring. And this affects then future intimacy with your spouse and even how you relate to other people as it trains your mind to objectify people on a very basic day-to-day level. So even in your own mind's fantasy, you're degrading other people. And so whether it's erotic or emotional, when another person becomes an object for self-gratification, you're not loving them, you're using them. So we see a holistic understanding of the effects of lust, that that it's offensive to God and destructive to yourself and degrading to others. But but Job wants to take us even further, and and he dives into the roots of lust. And, And we learn that lust is Not only an issue of the eye, if you remember in verse 1, Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes, but ultimately it is an issue of the heart. That's why he says in verse 17, if my heart has been led by my eyes, and then, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 7 he says that, and then in verse 9 he says, if my heart has been enticed by a woman. You see, the eyes are a window into the heart. And so we need to recognize that when there's struggle with sexual sin, whether it's lust or pornography, the hookup culture, prostitution, sadomasochism, whatever it is, sexual activity outside God's design in marriage, there is more going on underneath the surface than just some basic animal instinct. There is a heart issue going on. Now, I want to get really practical here, so let me put forth what I think are three common root causes of lust and pornography and other sexual activity outside God's design. Because it's not just about uh, like having enough willpower to say no. Right? It's more than just like, oh, if I had the discipline, there's something going on underneath that. So what are some of the root causes? Let me name three really briefly. One, one of the root causes... Uh, for unchecked lust is longing for intimacy. You see, God created us for intimacy. That's why we want to be loved and known by other people. Ultimately, that means intimacy with God and intimacy with others in the context of healthy community. So often when we fall into sexual sin, it's because we're chasing after intimacy, but we're willing to settle for cheap substitutes. It's instant gratification without having to give or sacrifice or be inconvenienced for for anybody else. You see, love is self-giving. Lust is always self-serving. It's about me and what I get out of it. So we long for intimacy, but it's so much easier if we don't have to couple that with commitment the way that God designed us to. So that's one common that's that's one common root cause. Another one is uh, disappointment in life or anger towards God. Like life hasn't worked out the way you thought it would, and maybe you've you're even angry at God. Well, that's uh, fertile soil for selective obedience to God. So looking at pornography or indulging in sexual sin it is their way of saying, God, I tried your way. I tried it and it didn't work. You let me down, so I'm doing it my way. And so maybe in the midst of our disappointment or anger, we need to recognize that we've held God to some promises that he didn't make. And we need to not only deal with the surface issue of our behavior, but the deeper issues of why we're angry or disappointed in God. So that's a second common cause. And and the last common root cause is just simply looking for comfort or an escape. If you think about when people usually sin sexually, how often is it when you're down or discouraged or bored or frustrated because things aren't going well and you're looking for comfort or an escape from all the hardships of life, something that feels good and doesn't demand anything from you? So we often think lust is simply a matter of following our bodily impulses when in fact there's something deeper going on. 
and you're looking for comfort when we should be going to God for comfort, first and foremost, and to our community of family and friends. Now, as I address this topic today, I know many of you feel defeated already, right? Like, I've tried this and I can't get over it. I, I, I can't say what Job says, that I've kept my eyes pure. So the question is, how do we respond to this? I mean, I could just lay on the standards of God's holiness and tell the guys, man up, and talk to the woman and say, hey, you're better than that. And and there may be a place for that. But I think the firm hand of rebuke has to be accompanied by the gentle words of grace. And, And the gentle words of grace must get to the root of the problem, not just the eyes, but the heart. So while Job gives us a model of faithfulness, he doesn't give us the full picture of the remedy in our failure. But he does point us to Christ, who who, who not only walked in sexual purity, but took the burden of our sexual impurity upon himself. He took it all on himself so that when God sees us, none of of our sexual brokenness or impurity does he see in us. But when he looks to Christ, it's all on him. Jesus went to the cross, not just to deal with generic sin, but to deal with specific sins. And and in our case today, the sexual sin of pornography or sleeping around or objectifying and using other people. Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for those sins. I love how particular Job is when he talks about sin throughout this chapter. It's not just generic, right? Like God, you know, like, you know, if I have sinned, then would God judge me? No, he goes into very concrete, uh, specific ways of confessing, uh, of naming these sins. And that changes our approach, right? As we understand the grace that is given to us and the forgiveness, it's not just saying, stop it. That's bad. God doesn't like it. That's a moralistic approach. Our approach begins and flows from the good news of Jesus Christ, that there is complete forgiveness. And so our response is twofold. On one hand, we say no to sin. Recognize it for what it is and say no to it immediately. But you can't just stop there. If your strategy is only negative or like you're playing defense without offense, you're you're never going to win that battle. You have to say no to sin, but you have to say yes to something greater. You have to say yes to Christ. In other words, you have to replace that desire. You have to replace the weaker desire with a greater desire. You have to turn your minds to a greater satisfaction, walking in freedom and repentance in Christ. Maybe one of the applications for you today might be talking to a trusted friend openly and confessing. Again, sexual sin grows because it is hidden and and people deceive themselves saying it's not a problem. So maybe, maybe that's your challenge today or the next step, to confess to a trusted friend and say no to, to sin and turn to Christ. And, and, and as you turn to him, may your desire for Christ find a greater satisfaction in your heart that will quench any kind of desire for lust that will lead you down a path of deceit and duplicity. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and let's pray. God, we confess today the sin of lust in all its various forms, in our minds, in our hearts, in our eyes, and even in, in, through, in and through our bodies. We say no to that, and we turn to you and say yes. We, we turn to you, and, and as we grow in our relationship with you, maybe we don't know what this means, but we want to find greater satisfaction. We want to find a greater desire for you and your kingdom. We want to find a, a, a passion and a joy in walking in freedom and repentance in you. So Lord, we know that on one hand, this battle will never end until until the new heavens and new earth. But until that time, Lord, may we find victory in this battle day after day 
year after year. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You know, one thing that really struck me about Pastor Sung's message was, you know, how he talked about this false allure of lust really comes out of the God-given desire for intimacy, intimacy with God and, and intimacy with one another. And so I want to challenge you this week, um, instead of just kind of filing this message away with all the others you've heard, to consider what might your next step be in pursuing deeper intimacy with God or pursuing, you know, a deeper, more vulnerable community with other believers who can support you and, and drive you closer to God. So yeah, consider this week, what is your next step? And we hope that you'll return again next week because we're gonna close out this mini series in Job 30 with 31 within the context of the book of Job and the series we're on. And we're looking at destructive idols that erode our hearts and, and we're gonna specifically talk about power and control. Yeah, so I hope you will join us next week as we continue in this series. And I wanna invite you especially to join us in person, uh, whether you haven't yet or or it's been a while since you've joined us in person, we would love to see you and worship with you at any of our three locations. So I hope you'll worship in person with us next week, but if you're not yet ready or able, don't worry. You can always join us right back here online at 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. next Sunday morning. Absolutely, and Jesus reminds us of what's most important. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So let's go now and do that as we go and be the church.